Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out to my talk. Uh, I'm Yati. I work at StackRocks. It's a small startup, and we do container security and container. We are always on the con bleeding edge of container security research. So this is my talk, Pensieve, finding malicious artifacts in container environments. So for all you Harry Potter fans out there, this is a quote from Dumbledore. I use the Pensieve. One simply siphons the excess thoughts from one's mind. It becomes easier to spot patterns and links when they are in the swarm. Wouldn't it be great if we had a Pensieve for container environments? As we shall, we shall see in the stock, we really do need a tool that transforms containers into a form that makes it easier for us to spot patterns and links. So imagine you're running your workloads on AWS. You have a bunch of virtual machines, and you recently deployed containers to better utilize your resources. You get a call at 2 AM in the morning, and you just found out that you, one of the containers is breached. Like, what do you do for incident response? So containers have become really popular among developers and DevOps. It's much faster to run a container compared to a virtual machine, and it comes at a lower disk footprint. As more and more infrastructures adopt containers, the incentives to attack them also increases. Security is one of the major concerns when it comes to deploying containers in production, and industry is still gathering slow momentum there. And this is even so true for incident response, Forensic analysis and you know, tools and techniques in container environments are barely known or even explored. So this talk is more about like, how do we do forensics in containers? Existing tools and techniques work well with virtual machines, but it's not so efficient when it comes to containers. Imagine having to snapshot the entire host memory in order to look at a single process, or even when your workloads are entirely on container managed services like AWS Fargate, where you don't even have the luxury to run host memory capture tools like uh, Linux Memory Extractor, for example. So existing techniques don't fundamentally change, but they need adjustments to make sense of container artifacts. So imagine having to, like, if you have to extract evidence from a single container, there's no tailor-made solutions when there are hundreds of containers running on the host. So in this talk, I'll describe what considerations you have to make when it comes to containers. I'll first give you an overview of Docker containers and then uh, outline some of the methods you can use to gather evidence and correlate them to specific containers. So Docker is an open source platform to easily manage your Docker containers. And what are containers? Containers are basically a bunch of sandbox processes. They are given an illusion of isolation using Linux abstractions called as C groups and namespaces. In Docker's terminology, though, a container is just an instantiation of an image. An image is basically a file that encapsulates all the metadata you, read, you need to create a bunch of processes. And Docker identifies containers using this unique identifier called as container ID. And images are identified by image ID. Having these IDs makes it easier to correlate artifacts found in containers. So what are namespaces? Namespaces basically implement resource uh, process isolation. It limits what a, or what a process can see in terms of resources such as files, users, or even file directories, and so on. For example, like the PID namespace controls PID mapping, and the net, net namespace allows network isolation, and so on. You could list all the namespaces available on Linux under the proc file system. Here's an example where I create a new PID namespace and run bash under it. If you run a ps command, you'll see that bash is mapped to PID1, but it's obviously mapped to a different PID on the host. Imagine you're looking at some logs produced by a process running in a container. The PIDs logged in, in those logs might appear differently, different than the host. So having the, the context of host namespace makes correlating them easy. And control groups or C groups are another Linux abstraction that have been there for a long time, and they implement quotas for processes. So one can limit how much memory a process consumes or how much uh, child processes that they can fork. You know, they, get, they, they limit what abuse one can do, and they also track resource usage. <clears throat> 
There are almost like 12 C groups in Linux today, and they represent various subsystems like devices, memory, how many processes you can, you can fork, and so on. Here's an example of creating a memory C group and limiting it to 100 bytes. It's an unrealistic example, but it's just an example. C groups don't impact forensic analysis so much, but they definitely give you more context on how much resource your containers are using. So it's important to, uh, it's important to understand how files are modified in Docker containers so that you can perform forensic analysis and you can reconstruct files and correlate them better to a specific container. Docker containers use specialized file system drivers to access files, and they're based on what is known as the layered file system. So what is a layered file system? Layered file system is basically a file system driver that gives you the ability to create like a single unified file system out of different layers. And on the right hand side here, you see an example of a Docker image. Basically, it's composed of various layers. And when a container is instantiated, a thin rewrite layer is created and it's set as a topmost layer. And all the writes that go through the container are actually executed in this topmost layer. But all the underlying layers remain read only. And they, they use the strategy called as copy on write to modify files that are present in one of these layers, basically. And on the left-hand side, you see an example of Docker file. Docker file basically is a file that captures all the instructions that you need to create a Docker image. Here's an, another example of a layered file system known as the OLAFS. And it comes as a default in the latest versions of Docker. An OLAFS is basically similar to AUFS, but it's much faster and it comes with a simpler implementation. Here you see that it has basically two layers. One is called the lower directory or the image layer, which remains read-only, and the upper directory is read-write, and the merge directory gives you like a uniform view of the file system. The memory layout of a process running inside a container remains pretty much the same. It has the usual stack heap data and text segment like any other Linux process. But we, need, we really need tools that can actually gather evidence from a single process rather than having to snapshot the entire host memory. So when it comes to disk forensics on a Docker host, it's pretty much the same on a, as you would do it on a regular system. You would ideally create like a disk dump using dd command and ideally the main memory. But using traditional tools will not give you a complete picture unless the specifics of Docker are considered. So Docker, there are several issues one must consider when you perform forensic analysis on a Docker host. Like I mentioned, Docker accesses files through specialized file system drivers which don't map to a block device. And this makes mapping recovered files to a specific container tricky. And files could be deleted from the read-write layer or the read-only layer, which must be considered. And the, the container itself could be dead, which wipes out most of the metadata. And this makes forensics really, really challenging. Live analysis implies that containers are still running. And you have several options here. Basically, a security analysis could like back up the container file system and all the metadata on a regular basis. And Docker provides several options here. One could do a Docker export to capture, all, capture the container's file system into a tar file, or one could save the Docker image into a tar file, or one could commit all the changes that are happening in the container into a new image using Docker com commit command. And all these files could be later used to perform analysis using Docker import or Docker load. One thing to note here is that Docker export and import command don't preserve the image history, but the Docker save and load preserves the image history. And knowing the image history becomes important if you want to find out if the image layer has been tampered with. So like I mentioned, having container metadata is really important when it comes to analysis when you, to perform correlation. And Docker usually by default stores all this metadata under wallib docker, 
And if you can, if you want to look at a specific container, you could go into the container subdirectory and look at it. And here you will see like various information related to container layer, the image layers, the container ID, the image ID, all the mounted directories, and so on. So if a file is deleted from a container, there could be two possibilities. The file originates from the read-write layer or the file originates from the image layer. So when files are deleted from the read-write layer, it's actually deleted on the host file system. And then to recover those files, you would need to employ techniques that you would employ to recover files from a host file system. There are two popular techniques. One is called the file carving method, and the other one is called the file system analysis method. File carving method is basically a recovery technique that, are, that is employed when there's no file system metadata. And what this technique does is basically it scans the entire disk and it looks for patterns. And the patterns typically used are header values from, the, from popular file formats like PDF, ELF, JPEGs, and so on. But files are often fragmented on the file system. And this technique does not guarantee full reconstruction of files with all its metadata intact. And when you want to relate files to its originating containers, it becomes crucial that you have all the metadata, like the file path and the file name. That's where the other technique comes into play, which is the file system analysis. This technique is driven by, it's, it makes much more informed decisions based on the file system metadata. It uses the metadata such as the master file table, the inode table, the, the directory entries, and so on. And this technique actually provides you some guarantees of recovering the file with all the metadata intact. So this is much more useful when it comes to analyzing containers and correlating files to a specific container. If a file is deleted from the read-write layer, though, what the file system driver does is it tags such files, and it allocates a new inode and tags it as a character, type, character device. And one could find such files using a find command under the images directory. So assuming that you recovered a file using previous techniques, I'll describe how you can associate that file to a specific container. So the first thing you will need is a Docker ID. And Docker ID can be found by running Docker PS command, assuming the container is still running. And this example is based on the AUFS driver. And all the files in AUFS are stored in under varlib docker AUFS. And here you will find a layer subdirectory which has all the various layers of the image. But the file could originate from any one of these layers. And if you look at the layer subdirectory, it has a bunch of AUFS IDs. Uh, so you really need the AUFS ID from the, uh, from the file path that you, that you recovered. And once you have the AUFS ID, what, what you could do is go through all the containers and look at their mount IDs. And they, the mount IDs are nothing but the AUFS IDs. And in order to associate a file to a container, you could match the AUFS IDs found here to the AUFS IDs in the layers. And if you find a match, you basically found the file where it originated from. So traditional tools that are typically used for memory forensics, such as memory Linux extractor, requires you to snapshot the entire host memory. And this, this is a time-consuming operation, and several cloud providers don't even allow you to run these tools. You'd have to file a service ticket or something in AWS to have them retrieve the host memory. So this makes it challenging for containers. And even if you have the host memory dump, it, it, it's really tricky to associate like specific evidence you find there to a specific container. And this is where newer tools like Cryu offer much more potential. We shall see that in the next few slides. So what's Cryu? Cryu stands for Checkpoint and Restore in User Space. It's been around for a while, and it's basically a tool that will allow you to freeze a running process and checkpoint it as a bunch of image files on disk. It basically walks through every task of a process, and it'll find out all the resources that it uses, and then it basically converts them to an image format. And these image files can be used to restore them back to a running process. 
And this opens up a lot of interesting use cases like live migration, debugging, load balancing, and so on. If you watch like the KubeCon like several years back, they had a Quake game and they could like literally freeze the Quake game and they, they would do a live mi migration from Singapore to London and they would resume the game back. That was, that was done through Cryo actually. But it also has applications in forensics as we shall see. Cryo also comes with this tool called as Crit or the Cryo image tool. And this tool basically helps you to analyze and decode the image files that you produce during the checkpointing process. It is similar to volatility in that it provides you a few plugins that makes it easier to retrieve the running processes, the files that the processes used, the network connections and the memory mappings and so on. Let's see this in a demo and how we can use Cryo to perform a memory forensics. So in this demo, what I'm going to do is I'll spin up a container and the container is running a web application. It's a very simple web application that's using a vulnerable version of Apache struts. And this was basically behind the Equifax attack a few months back. And I'll use Metasploit to attack this container and we shall checkpoint the container and see what kind of evidence we find in the container. So here I launched the container. I'll take a snapshot using Cryu. And here's, here are all the image files it produces. And here is an example of using Crit. And PS is basically one of the plugins that you can use to see list all the running processes at, at the time of checkpointing. Here you see that there's only one process running. And we can also find out all the network connections that were active during checkpointing process. There's two network connections active. It's listening on 8080 and 809. And you can also see all the files that were opened by the process. Sorry about that, I think it's flickering. And then we can restore the container back so that we can launch another attack. So I'll launch Metasploit. And so basically what Metasploit is doing is it's um, using one of the exploits. I'm using the reverse shell here. You could use any exploit. And so I'm establishing a reverse shell on the container. And just to make sure we are in the container, I'm running an IP adder. And the IP address is actually the IP address of the container. And here I'm basically making another snapshot. And here you see that there's another process running, which is basically the shell process for the reverse shell. And we can see all the network connections. And there's another network connection. And the 4444 is actually the port on the local machine. And that's the IP address of the local machine. We can also see all the files that were opened by the shell. It's not doing much, but get the point. So that's essentially what Cryo can do. It has a few plugins, but in future you can see this expanding. It's like volatility. So to summarize my talk, basically we saw that we need more container aware forensic tools to make them much useful. And you saw that uh, Docker uses file system drivers, which makes associating files to containers tricky. We also saw that popular tools like volatility need more Docker context in order to make them more useful. We saw how Cryo can be used for forensics. We also saw that container orchestrators and container managed services makes, and even deleted containers make, make forensics really challenging. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, these are all the references I used. And thank you, thanks for coming out. I know it's the last talk.
Thank you. If you have any questions, you can take it. Yes. Yeah. The third one you didn't mention, does it capture the memory component? Does it? Do you know? Uh, like the. In your capture. Oh, uh, for the host or for the container itself? The Docker container. The Docker container? Uh, so for the Docker container, uh, there's not a lot of uh, tools out there, but Cryo is one of them that you can use to specifically capture a container's memory. It actually, con it actually ca captures a specific container's memory. Only the main memory, not the disk memory. Yes, yes. Any other question? Yes. Yes. You can use uh, um, a tool called Contract. Oh, sorry. So the question was basically if you could use the proc file system to track network connections. So yes, you can use the proc file system use, like, because you have all the FTs in the proc file system and you can identify if an FT is a socket type and you can decipher. I think there's a tool called Contract that uh, basically like polls the proc file system for a specific PID and it keeps track of all the network connections there. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. You basically use the PID to associate a container SPID to a host SPID. Any other questions? Can't see anything. Okay, well, that, that's the final talk of the day. Um, thank you, Yati. Thank you. Here's a nice gift for you from B-Sides and Autodesk. Thank you. And yeah. um, let's give them a hand.